All right, Kent, I got one o'clock Eastern. It's okay if I go ahead and kick us off officially. Good, sir. Yeah, let's do it. All right, welcome. Cool. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast. Good morning if you're out on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for being here for uh, a special webinar. We're going we're gonna to change up the format a little bit because uh, we thought it was a good time for uh, a little fireside chat, maybe a little pep talk, some interactive Q&A. And we got our good friend Kent Stroman here uh, that's going to help us uh, uh, do that. So we're here to talk about year-end fundraising. We're recording this on November 20th. So if you're watching the recording, I hope you're having a good day no matter where you are. And hopefully you'll get some tidbits here. It's not too far into year-end. But thank you all for joining us. It's going to be a fun hour or so. And uh, I'm so happy to see a full room here. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Just want to let you all know that we are recording this session. We will be sending out the recording later on today. So if you get interrupted or maybe a toddler bursts into your home office or something like that, don't worry. We'll get you the recording. No slides today. We're going pure Q&A. So please ask questions. We are here uh, literally for you to answer your questions, talk about whatever is on your mind for year-end fundraising. Uh, nothing's off the table. So don't be shy. Don't sit on those hands. There's a chat box and a Q&A box. You can use either of those. We'll keep an eye on both. Um, but we would love to hear from you. We are literally here just to answer your questions rather than kind of a, a formal presentation. You can also uh, send us your questions and comments on Twitter. I'll keep an eye on uh, the Twitter feed if you are a Twitter type person like me. Uh, but again, we'd love to hear from you. So hopefully you've come with some questions. If this is your first Bloomerang webinar, Welcome. This is a little bit of a different one, but we usually do these webinars a couple times a week. So check out our webinar page. We'll get you invites to all of our upcoming sessions. We love doing these webinars. Um, eight years on, I think we're, we're closing in on uh, over 500 sessions since 2012. It's amazing. Wow. Um, but if you've never heard of Bloomerang, we are a provider of donor management software. So if you were interested in that, maybe you need new software before the end of the year, you're going to be shopping next year. Check us out. Uh, visit our website. There's all kinds of videos and stuff you can watch and, and get a real good sense of, you know, kind of what we're all about. Um, don't do that right now because we're in for a real fun hour. Speaking of those 500 webinars, it would not be a Bloomerang webinar series year without our good friend Kent Stroman. He has been a, uh, a stalwart, uh, one of our early adopters. Uh, we, we, got to, we convinced him to come on and, and do some of our first sessions back in 2012, 2013. Uh, joining us from beautiful Oklahoma. Kent, how you doing? You doing okay? I'm doing great. And it's, yeah. it's a just shy of beautiful day in Oklahoma. We'll be almost, almost beautiful. Low 70s, got a little bit of cloud cover. Uh, great day to wow. be alive. That's nice. That's, that sounds like Midwestern weather. You know, it just, and even though it's fall, winter, it's still beautiful. It's same weather here in Indy. It's like uh, partly sunny, 70. You brought the sunshine. That's what it was. It, it was you. <laughs> Um, thanks for doing this, by the way, this is, this was a really awesome, actually it was, it was sort of Kent's idea to do it, um, to do this session and do it this way because he is an awesome person and uh, a servant hearted person and, uh, he really wants to help you. So that's why we're here to talk about all things year end fundraising, kind of a nice way to wrap up the week before the uh, Thanksgiving holiday for sure. If you don't know Kent, check him out. He's a CFRE. He's written a ton of books. Uh, he speaks all the time. You, uh, some people were in the chat were already saying that they had seen you speak uh, in, in other places, Kent. Um, check him out. We're going to give you all the information um, to, to follow him. Does lots of really great trainings. And uh, I think I got all your books behind me, Kent. I can see a couple of them there. Um, yeah. And uh, you're def definitely someone you're going to want to know if you don't already know Kent. So we are here <clears throat> to talk about you're in fundraising. Kent, do you want to kick us off with a, a question to the group? I think you had something that uh, sure. was sort of on, on your mind, maybe get their gears turned, but let's do it. Yeah, but first I have to laugh. Cindy just put a question. Stephen, are you picking paint colors? Yes. Go with the dark green. It's Well, both is boomerang <laughs> green. We got a two-tone. That's some, that's some artwork by my son. He loves the boomerang green, so he always gravitates towards that uh, construction paper, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's cool. So, um, <laughs> You know, I was looking back and I think it was um, back in January when we first started talking about doing yeah. the webinar in November. And uh, <laughs> here we are in November. What a year. <laughs> and um, our actually another kind of interesting thing, 
did you look at today, today's date? This is 11, 20, 2020. Wow. Um, so uh, as we come to the end of 2020, um, I've, I've been hearing lots of questions, concerns, some anxiety around what do we do with our year-end fundraising appeal? So I just want to pose a question, and I would love for people to respond to it um, because I, I just want to share some, some some thoughts that are on my mind and respond to questions people may have. So here's here's the question: As you work on your 2020 calendar year-end appeal, what are you apprehensive about? Any apprehension, mm -hmm. concern? Um, if you'll just put that in the uh, the Q and A box, um, we'll take a look. Yeah. And by the way, I see uh, Brandon from Catholic Charities, uh, a client. Good to, good to see you. Uh, I see a question about how many times do you recommend sending out emails and snail mail? Uh, don't want to overdo it. Um, how many months into 2021 is a standard for year end, raising year end funds? Good question. Um, uh, somebody says, made a statement, making too many asks. Uh, somebody finding time to get it done. Um, the COVID world is new, and thankfully that. Um, apprehensive about making donations too many times. People are concerned with the economy, the election, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Stephen, does any of this sound new to you? Nope, I've been hearing this for, for many, many months. Yeah, it's right on. <laughs> and in, in, here's, the, here's one of the thoughts I want to share, is um, the themes, the specific themes may be new, but the ideas are perpetual. Hmm. I was working with a client one time, and they said they were trying to decide when to launch their, uh, when, when to get started on their, their major capital campaign. And we couldn't do it now because of an election cycle. And then after that, you know, there's going to be the economy. And then after that, uh, school's going to be ending, and it's going to be summer. And um, so I think really the big question that we all have to ask, and I, I want to encourage us to start with this, and that is why would anybody ever give anything to your organization? I mean, that's a really big, important question. And to help frame the answer, and I can't answer it for somebody else, uh, but, but what I want to do is give you some tools on how you can answer this for yourself. And here, here's the question. Question number one, what is your mission? Hopefully the answer to that is a board adopted statement that's 10 words or less. What is your mission? And then question number two is in the current season, however you want to define that, is your mission relevant? Now, those are two pretty simple questions, but when you put them together, I want to take us to a powerful place. We have a mission, we know what it is, and it is relevant. So if that is the case, when should you raise money? Always. Now, if there's something about this particular season that makes your mission irrelevant, don't ask for money. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna use the example of a couple of examples. One is a, a food bank. Um, the other would be a rescue mission. So these are b both basic needs kinds of organizations. And I don't say that to exclude other kinds of organizations, let's say the arts, for example. But I think it's really easy for people to relate to basic needs. Um, so when you think about if, if our mission is to defeat food insecurity, in my case, let's say in, in Eastern Oklahoma, what would you say is the effect of the 2020 variables on our mission? Has the need gone away? Is the need the same? Or is the need increased? So Stephen, you're a pretty good guesser. If you had to guess an answer to that, what, what would you say? Probably increased need for a food bank, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, probably increased need. And um, so here, here are some of the questions that I hear. Um, I mean, how can we ask people for gifts when things are so unsettled? And then I, I hear these words. And I, I'm going to say eight words. 
And if, for people who are, who are listening, if you're taking notes, I want to ask you to write down these eight words. Some of them aren't words, they're pairs of words, okay? So COVID-19, election, coronavirus, politics, pandemic, voting, racial tension, economy. So eight words. <clears throat> and um, I wish we were all in the room, same room together, Steve, because I would love to ask this question, see, see the response. And that is, who would raise your hand and say, those are eight words that I've heard way too much of, and I don't need to hear those words anymore. Maybe for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, Stephen, would, how, how would you react to that? Yeah, I'm with you. I could do without hearing about them. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I'm going to give you a caveat. I'll come back to that in a minute. But here's what I want to say as you think about your fundraising appeal at the end of 2020. Don't use any of those words. Mm. Don't give them a positive connotation. Don't give a negative connotation. Your audience has heard all of those words more than they ever wish they had. And they don't need you to reinforce it. <clears throat> Now, here's the exception. If your mission, or if the name of your organization, or if the mission of your organization is this, then you should use these words. And that is the Center for Perpetuating Panic and Division. Okay? If that's the name of our organization, if that's our mission, is to perpetuate panic and division, then use those words. They'll serve you well. But if not, what do you want to focus on? Focus on your mission. And what is the purpose for the organization? What is the problem that you seek to solve? We said, we don't want any kids in our neighborhood going to bed hungry at night. And if the pandemic, if the current environment has been something that has increased demand for our services, then I would just make a, a, a recognition that says, you know, um, in recent months, we've experienced an unprecedented demand for our services. You don't need to delineate what it is. And part of the reason that we say that is what if we make the issue something different than what the issue is, the mission, mm -hmm. and that issue goes away, what happened? There was a pandemic and then a, a vaccine came out. So you must not need my money anymore, right? So, um, <clears throat> So anyhow, the, um, uh, I, I want to give some, some practical ways on how we can craft our messaging. And it doesn't matter what method you use to disseminate the message. Um, Stephen made reference to Bloomerang. And um, I, I will tell you that I was a Bloomerang fan before there even was a Bloomerang. So <laughs> thank you for creating the solution to that need. But um, the a part of that, the beauty of that tool is the ability to deliver uh, specific personalized targeted messages to our constituents, right? <clears throat> and so <clears throat> whether you're speaking face-to-face, one-on-one, uh, whether you're communicating in, this, in a room like this, a Zoom room with a whole bunch of people, um, are, the, are you and I the only ones here, Stephen? <laughs> got about a hundred other people. Oh, wow. So we got a whole bunch of people in the room, whether it's that, whether it's an email or um, a snail mail, whatever it is, you want to craft your message in such a way that it accomplishes the intended result. And so um, I want to give you actually um, three things to start with on your year end appeal. Begin by writing a one sentence call to action. When you send this message out, what do you want the reader or what do you want your audience to do? What's one thing? And let me give you a couple of, of uh, alternatives. Some of the appeals that I get, based on what I read, what they want me to do is care. There's no specific expression of that care but we just want you to care. And I don't know if I'm supposed to feel good or if I'm supposed to feel bad, but evidently that's the main thing they want us to feel. And if that's your objective, state it clearly and then build the rest of the messaging around that. But for a fundraising appeal, 
whether it's year end, year beginning, year middle, whatever, the principles are all the same. If this is a fundraising appeal, the call to action is please give. And then you're probably going to suggest one or two avenues through which to take that action. So um, step number one, write a one sentence call to action. What do you want the reader to do? And by the way, when you voice this message, voice it to a person, not to a group. A group is not going to read your message. A person is going to read it or throw it away. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, don't, uh, don't say dear friends of the food um, pantry. Um, and then proceed to say, I know that you all, blank, you all aren't reading it. You are reading it. And don't know things that, that aren't true. So that's the second tip I want to give you is to speak to one person, not to a group. And one of the things that I find really helpful, if you want to really write a powerful, some powerful copy, think about who is the ideal profile of your donor. If you could boil it down to just one person that you want to take the action that you're proposing, sit down face to face with that person and communicate with them. So for this, let's say that person the, the, that fits the profile at every point has a name. He's Stephen Shattuck. So um, I, when, I, when Stephen and I sit down and have a conversation and I ask him to do something in response to my message, um, I'm probably not going to tell him the things that I know about him. I know that you are, that you really care about three-legged cats. Um, I, I know that turkey is your favorite meal at Thanksgiving. Um, the, the stuff that we claim to know and we don't know actually ends up being off-putting rather than inviting. And so speak to a person, don't speak to a group, don't know things that you don't know. And, uh, and, and be relevant. So a part of that goes to the third tip I'm gonna suggest, and that is segmentation. And again, Stephen didn't ask me to do this, but I wanna tell you, Bloomerang is a powerful tool for segmenting your message. So for example, speak differently to non-donors than you do to donors. Mm -hmm. So Stephen, back to you and I, our conversation. Um, you've never contributed to the food pantry. How would it sound if I said to you, I want to thank you for your past support. Right. And we want you to please continue. Stephen said, okay, I've done nothing in the past and I'll be happy to continue that. <laughs> we don't need to talk any further. Right? <laughs> um, so don't thank somebody for their generous support. If they're not, if they haven't been generous, if they haven't even given. So speak differently to non-donors than you do to donors. Here's another part of segmentation. And, you know, we could spend a whole week on this, right? <laughs> We're not going to. Um, but, but part of the reason is I don't want you to ask a $1,000 donor to consider a $100 gift. Mm -hmm. But you'll be amazed at how often we do that. I mean, I get these letters that say, would you give $10 or $50 or $1,000 or $2,500 or $10,000? And when I see that, I see they have absolutely no idea who they're talking to. And so using the example, if we've got a thousand dollar donor, I'm going to ask him, would you consider a gift of a thousand dollars or perhaps this year, even bump that up to two, three, five thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, but, but don't ask a thousand dollar donor for a hundred dollar gift. Stephen, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, you're speaking my language. It, it seems like, you know, for a year end appeal, it's kind of monolithic, right? We have our year end appeal. It's going to go out to everybody in Boomerang and everybody in Razor's Edge. And, and that's what you're advising against, right? Maybe you would have multiple versions of that appeal or parts of that campaign for different types of people. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And um, uh, um, I guess you've probably already figured out that I'm a bit of a critic of <laughs> poor fundraising. And uh, I get so much of it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I just find some halfway humorous and halfway offensive 
is I'll get an envelope addressed to Kent Stroman. And then I open it up and it says, dear friends. Mm -hmm. And I think that's odd. They knew my name outside right. the envelope, but they have no clue who I am inside the envelope. Is it that hard? Right. I mean, really, how hard is it to put my name on the inside of the envelope if you can put it on the outside of the envelope? Um, and so Michelle just posted, you must make people feel like you know them and they're not a vending machine trying to get candy. Yeah. And again, connect where you can connect, uh, but don't be presumptuous or make assumptions. So, um, you know, Stephen, one of the things we talked about was um, uh, you probably saw my equation. C plus C plus C equals C. Um, no mathematician would tolerate that. <laughs> Maybe we end up with C to the third power. So, so um, what, what is it? We said clear plus concise plus candid equals compelling ask. How can we be clear? What does it mean to be concise, candid, and then end up being compelling. And so, um, I don't know, you want me to just dive in there? Yeah. So um, what, what I want to say is, as I listen to people, they're, they're saying, you know, oh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid to ask somebody for a gift because um, 2020 might have hit them really hard. They, maybe they lost their job. Mm -hmm. um, their, their portfolio lost its value. Check the stock prices, by the way. Uh, these interesting assumptions we made there. Um, I, I can't ask him for a gift. Their candidate just lost an election mm -hmm. or their candidate just won an election. Uh, they've contributed to an election campaign. Oh, if the, if we don't want to raise money, here's what I want to say is any excuse will work just fine. Yeah. But if we do want to raise money, there's no obstacle that's too great that we can't overcome it. And so what do we go back to? We're going to revert back to our mission and back to our relevance. There are still children in our neighborhood who are going to bed hungry at night. Um, would you consider being a solution to their problem? And um, would we, I'm going to go back two years ago. So in November, 2018, would we ask that question of our donor base? Of course we would. Might there be somebody in there who had suffered hard times that year? Yep. Sure. We don't know. Did we not ask everybody because we might have, quote, been insensitive to somebody? No, we're not going to do that. So no matter when we ask, we're going to always be sensitive, thoughtful, inclusive. And the way that we avoid that... Um, that big question about, um, you know, how can we be sensitive and yet bold is sensitive. We always ask and we never demand. Whether it's on 11, 20, 20, 20, or any, any other date you want to plug in. These are our principles, communication principles, fundraising principles. Doesn't matter what day of the week, week of the month, month of the year, what year it is. Um, always ask, never demand. And if we respectfully ask of someone who is not in a position to respond, they're going to be grateful that they were asked. If we make a demand of someone, regardless of their circumstance, they're going to be unappreciative. So let's be sure and, and frame our ask that way. Bold is unapologetic. I mean, when you lead off with, I really hate to ask for this. Mm. Here's what we're, we're saying. I'm really not convinced that it's that good, a, good of an idea for us to keep children from going to bed hungry at night. So you don't really want to give to contribute to that cause, do you? No, be bold. Uh, don't be apologetic. We're asking on the merits of those who deserve something better. Stephen, would you consider making a gift, uh, the amount that would be appropriate for you, so that somebody else's family, those children might go to bed at night knowing where their next meal is coming from. Right. And if your circumstance is, you know what? I was at the food bank last week. I think you're gonna not be offended because you know somebody is helping people like you. 
and uh, maybe you were at the food bank last week asking for assistance and things turn around and next week you're going to be at the food bank giving assistance. Mm -hmm. What a great opportunity to be part of the solution, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, um, that, that's kind of a, a lead off of some thoughts about, you know, how can we be sensitive? How can we be bold at the same time? Um, clarity, to be clear in our ask, we're um, offering an answer to the reader's question, what am I supposed to do about this? Okay, and if, it's if all you want to do is be concerned, tell them we just want you to worry more. I don't know what that's going to do for anybody. <laughs> Um, but, but be clear and, and our, our tip number one, writing a one sentence call to action gives clarity. Now that's not the first sentence, but once we've written that first, we know what the rest of the text needs to speak to. Uh, concise. What is concise? Our, the purpose of our ask isn't to answer all of everybody's questions. It's not to answer all of anybody's questions. And I want you to think about this, and, and uh, this is probably maybe a little bit taxing. I think the purpose of well-written appeal is to cause people to want to know more. Mm. And what I found in communication is that uh, every time we communicate, either one or two things happens. One is um, you've told me more than I want to know, and I hope to never hear anything from you again. <laughs> right. The other one is, wow, how interesting. I'd love to hear more. <clears throat> so don't be afraid to save something for your next message. Be concise. Don't exhaust the topic. Therefore, don't exhaust your readers. And the only way we can say more is to talk less. So I think this might be a good point for me to do that, talk less <laughs> and to listen. Stephen, are there some, uh, some uh, questions that have popped up? Any yeah. thoughts that we want to speak to? We got some good ones. I was wondering if we could pull on a thread that you mentioned early on, Kent, because it's something that's been on my mind you know, since March. You, you mentioned the relevancy of the mission. And what I heard you say is that everyone's relevant, right? And, and, and this has been a little bit of a, a tension point, at least from folks that I've talked to. I hear the phrase COVID charity a lot, right? You know, mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not a COVID charity. We're not a food bank. To use your example, we're not, you know, providing uh, assistance to people who are out of work. And very important missions, clearly. But I think there's a lot of maybe animal welfare groups or environmental groups or uh, performing arts that all have very valuable missions, you know, regardless of what's going on and, you know, have certainly been affected by that. What would you say to those people who are maybe on the sidelines because they think their mission type is not appropriate right now? I think I know how you feel based on <laughs> you touching on it a little bit, but I definitely want to pull that out for folks because I want them to be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you have a pretty good clue, Stephen. But um, I, I will tell you, I've been asked that same question from some of those very organizations. And I'm going to pick on museum. Okay. And it, it, this is not fair, but this is a stereotype. A museum is where living people go to see dead objects. Right. Okay, that's not fair, but that's kind of a perception. And so with that perception, I mean, that's, that's kind of the worst case perception. Um, should we be asking for money now? Yeah. And I want to go back to that whole question of relevance. Is your mission relevant today? And before you answer that, I'm going to bias your answer. <laughs> if your mission is not relevant today, it probably wasn't relevant yesterday. Right. And it probably won't be relevant tomorrow. Or pre now, it may be more difficult for us to see the relevance today. And when that's the case, um, so we don't know why this, let's say an art museum, is relevant in the middle of a pandemic. Well, if, if we don't know, I want to say go read the newspaper. Actually, there are still some newspapers in print, a good source of information. But I want you to go see what's happening with people before, during, or after, or in lieu of being sick with a disease 
regardless of what the disease de jour is. And we're finding out that there are some very heavy negative consequences of people being locked away alone, whether it's alone at home or whether they wish they're at home and they wish they were alone. Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my, my uh, salute to all those parents who are trying to navigate school with the kids at home. It may be that you're alone at the office in my case, or Steven, in your case, we're the only <laughs> ones at the office, yeah. but um, nobody has adequately measured the burden of loneliness. And I'm not lonely in a hospital. That's a different kind of loneliness. But is there a, a, a solution to that in an art museum? Mm. Absolutely. Are we relevant? Yes. Do we deliver differently today than we did a year ago? Yes. And so here's what your constituents need to know. We exist for a purpose. That purpose remains the method by which we achieve that purpose is different today. And it was different a year ago, a decade ago, and a century ago. And we know it's going to be different a year from now, a decade from now, and a century from now. We don't know how. But in order for us to continue to do what we were created to do, we're dedicated to that. We needed your, past in the, we needed your support in the past. We need it today. Would you yep. consider? Does that help? Does that tie in, Stephen, with what you're thinking? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen the case for support spelled out this way. We want to we wanna still be here when this is all over, right? To the extent that it will be over, for sure. And I, that's kind of what I'm hearing you say is people cared about your, your park and your museum, to use your example before, and, and they want it to be there when we can get back to normal, you know, however normal things will be. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and here's another thing, which I think, you know, the use of the word normal and something that we want to retreat to that we know we'll never get back to the past. Mm -hmm. We're moving towards the future. And I think it's helpful. I mean, this may not be a, a really encouraging thought initially, <laughs> but I think it is helpful for us at an organizational level to ask this question. What if the things that we're worried about today never go away? Yeah. What if they only get worse? Yeah. Is our mission relevant? And if it isn't, it won't be. But if it is, it will be. And so with that, uh, we don't have to wait to know what the future, precisely what the future is going to be like. But we know it's going to largely be like it is today, except more or less of something. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the degree of that may be dramatic as was the case in March, 2020. Um, but but um, if, if our mission isn't relevant, here's what I would suggest that we should really give serious consideration to. Number one, stop asking for num money. And number two, begin dis dis dissolution actions. Right. Let's dissolve. Well, I, I uh, you know, let's get to some some of the audience questions since I, I jumped ahead with my own, but th there's one from Michaela here that I think dovetails nicely into what we were just talking about. Um, this concept of donor fatigue, right? Which I, I tend to think isn't necessarily a thing. I think it's usually, you know, bad communication fatigue. I think you probably would agree, Kent, but <laughs> I don't know about you, but I can't log on to Facebook without seeing multiple fundraisers for, nonprofits, for people who are out of work, you know, waiters and waitresses, it seems like there is a lot of generosity out there that is maybe unparalleled in other times of our at least recent history. It, 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 and I, I wonder if that's another way that people are getting stuck. They think, well, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, Kent, you know, they don't have the capacity, they may be out of work, they're getting inundated with a, a bunch of other requests, which may not be true. What would you say to the people who are saying, geez, we don't want to add to the noise uh, of, of asking for money? Yeah. Good, great questions. Man, where do you get this stuff, Stephen? I, the boomerang people are, are, are sharp. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So um, donor fatigue. Um, first of all, now I haven't always lived and I haven't always been in fundraising, but it's been a few decades, and as long as I've been in fundraising, and as far as I can see in the future, 
there's one kind of donor fatigue that always has existed and always will. Hmm. And um, that is that caring people have more possibilities to care about than what they have the capacity to care about. Mm -hmm. and, and that is an unchanging fact. It's always been that way and it always will be. And so what, what I'm referring to there is what I call universal donor fatigue. It's always been there, it always will be. You didn't create it and you can't solve it. And so, boy, this is gonna sound insensitive, Stephen, but you, we gotta ignore that. Mm -hmm. Now there's another donor fatigue and that's specific donor fatigue. And specific donor fatigue happens when we ask our donors, when we approach the marketplace, too often, too poorly, um, too much, too wrong, okay? We got responsibility for that. And that's what we need to put a stop to. And so um, the, somebody asked the question, how often should we ask? Mm -hmm. Man, read the research on that. Um, you know, if it's, if it's done well, 12 times a year is not too much. Right. If it's done even better, 24 times a year is not too much. Yep. Um, but I will tell you, I've got a, a fundraising newsletter on my desk right now that if I got that once a year, it'd be too much. It's too <laughs> tiresome. Okay. So um, again, don't let general or universal fundraising fatigue paralyze you. Don't even let it affect you. So going back to the specific, what do we do? We're responsible for what we do, right? And so um, I'm in a... I'm in a state of bias that this is a Kent Stroman bias and it has a, some professional underpinnings. <laughs> it doesn't deserve to be universalized, but here's what I would say. Stay away from giving Tuesday. Mm. And the reason is I think that giving Tuesday has created a concentration of donor fatigue. And all of a sudden we think, that if our organization's legitimate, we can't be absent on Giving Tuesday. Hmm. And here's what I want to say is I want to take the Giving Tuesday idea and pivot to a time that has mission relevance. Hmm. So if, um, if we're all about um, four-leaf clovers, Four-leaf clover season is not the first Tuesday after Thanksgiving. It's in March. So do our Giving Tuesday kind of thing in March when it ties into our, our relevance. Now, should we be invisible on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving? No, but here's what I want to suggest, uh, you know, one of the questions. Somebody asked, you know, when with all these different holidays that we have at the end of the year, you've got um, Thanksgiving, Hakka, Christmas, New Year's Eve, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when? For 2020, here's where I want to suggest your window is. It probably, the, the earliest open window for year in giving season is probably November 30th. Mm -hmm. That's the Monday after Thanksgiving. And that window probably pretty much closes on December 15th. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as, for year end giving, that's when we're probably going to make our most powerful ask. Hopefully it's not our only ask. Hopefully it's not our first ask with some donors, but as far as that general broad, uh, more of a shotgun appeal, that's probably our target. Um, but again, so don't do nothing then, but I personally, I wouldn't bank heavily on Giving Tuesday. And I will, I'll, I'll tell you another part of my bias is I see fundraisers, professional fundraisers, working their proverbial tail off to make it look like Giving Tuesday is a huge success. And mm -hmm. here's, here's what the result is. They've created another event that's gobbling up a lot of staff and volunteer time they're creating a lot of churn and they end up shifting a lot of gifts to make it look like giving Tuesday was that successful when it was dollars that they were going to be given anyhow. And which could have, would have, should have been given without all that extra uh, mm. churn of effort. 
So you've got my bias. And I mean, if you've got one and it's working and if it's effective, don't stop doing it yeah. um, and blame me. <laughs> but if, if you're doing that thing where it's just a lot of activity and no results, you can uh, blame me for giving you permission to take a break, do something that's meaningful at a time where when your ask will stand out against the silence rather than getting lost in the cacophony of uh, everybody hitting you in the face, trying to compete with, with Black Monday or whatever the thing is. Yeah. Uh, you're getting some amens in the chat, uh, Ken. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I've had Giving Tuesday people on my webinar series, this webinar series, and you didn't say anything they would disagree with. I mean, they're the first to say, you don't have to ask on Giving Tuesday. You can make it a stewardship day and that will stand out yeah. uh, to your point. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. Um, there's a, a nice question in here from Bill, uh, definitely germane to the, uh, the environment. Bill's used to doing a lot of personal visits this time mm -hmm. of year. Um, hasn't quite been able to replicate that with um, you know, emails and, and print letters. Are there things that they can do? Maybe video chats like this or you know, picking up the phone? What, what do you think about the people who wanna make those real high touch personal visits, but you know, can't do that because of um, you know, social distancing and wanting to stay safe and all those things? What do you think there? Yeah. By the way, you just threw out a new word to not put in the letter. That's social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but you're exactly right. And so um, uh, we, we have a unique opportunity because the people that we want to visit personally, that ordinarily would want us to visit them personally, now may have a special interest in no personal visits. Yep. I was corresponding last week with a 94-year-old woman that hasn't been out of her home since March, understandably. And can you imagine how she would respond if I said, hey, I'd like to come show up in your house. Right. It's like, no, go away. <laughs> um, and so um, he, as much as, as you and I both, Stephen, prefer to get face to face yeah. in person with people, that's not an available option right now. So set it aside. And what can we do instead? And here's one of the things I want to share with you. Instead, I've been able to get face to face. I mean, you and I are face to face right now. Right. And it took no travel time. Yep. Um, I've been face to face with people on other continents where if we didn't have travel restrictions, I wouldn't have gone. And so that negative has turned into a positive. And um, so what you want to do, and I'm going to go back to the example of the 94 year old. I wish we could visit face to face. We can't. Would you be receptive to a Zoom call? Which is what I ask her. Here's the reply yeah. I got. I hate Zoom. Okay. Now, some people hate Zoom. Some people love Zoom. Mm -hmm. So don't put one person's answer on everybody else. Okay. Would you be receptive? And if the answer is no, could we connect by phone? Mm. And if somebody says, no, I don't want to look at your face and I don't want to hear your voice. <laughs> Yeah. Would you mind if I dropped some material in the mail? Can I put it on your doorstep? I mean, whatever. Um, so we adapt. And, and the point is, we want to be individualized with individuals. And we want to be uh, group wise with groups. Yeah. Um, so again, I mean, I know that there are some as we approach the Christmas season, there are some who like to um, who like to give a gift of a poinsettia plant, mm -hmm. right? If that's your thing, and if the person's receptive, t call them, tell them, I'm gonna drop by your house, I'm gonna put it on your porch, I'm gonna ring the doorbell and run the other direction. Play with it, have some fun with it. Um, we're, we're being safe, we're having distance, and, uh, but, but I'm not neglecting you, I'm not ignoring you. And it, at the worst case scenario, say, you know what? I love, I, I wish we could sit down next to the fireplace like Kent and Steven are today. <laughs> uh, we're not going to be able to do that this year. I'm going to do this thing instead. And I'm looking forward to next year in hopes that we'll have an opportunity then. Yep. I love it. And you know, anecdotally, we've seen more people log phone calls in Bloomerang 
over the past nine months than, than ever before in as many years. So there seems to be something going on with the phone that really, really seems to work. Um, we've had a couple people, Kent, who aren't on a traditional uh, year-end calendar. Maybe they're on a fiscal year that kind of runs June to July or maybe uh, ends in October. Um, how can those people take advantage of this year-end season when it may not necessarily be their, uh, their year-end in terms of the internal calendar? Should they do anything yeah. different there, you think? You've worked with yeah. a lot of different orgs who have different, uh, different fiscal years. What do you think yeah. there? Yeah, great question. So first of all, let me make this acknowledgement. You're talking to a finance guy. <laughs> and so uh, when you say fiscal year, you're speaking my love language. <laughs> and, but here's the point about that. Nobody cares about your fiscal year. Mm. And in fact, I'll tell you, here's our recommendation. If your fiscal year is a calendar year, and if there's not some compelling reason for it to be that it has to be calendar year, we recommend that you shift to a, a July one year. And here's why. Mm. There's an organizational reason to ask for gifts and for donors to give on fiscal year end. There's an individual reason for donors to give at calendar year end. That's driven largely by the, the culture that's impacted by the IRS. Mm -hmm. And again, you didn't create it, you can't resolve it, but um, it's, it's tax policy, frankly, that drives us to think about making annual gifts in December. So I wanna be able to leverage that. Stephen, this may be a time for you to make a special gift, would you consider this before the clock strikes 12, you know, mm -hmm. before December 31st? So that's about you. In, in May, June, May and June, as we approach June 30th, that's about us. Now, that's not the strongest reason to ask, gift, to ask for gifts because of our needs, um, but I don't want to neglect it. And so here's what I want to say. As we approach the end of the year, we'd like to finish strong. We're close to, to our target of the number of, uh, of children that we're going to be able to, to feed. As we move into a new year, would you consider a special gift to pre-position the food pantry for uh, serving our community in the year that's, that will begin on July 1st? That makes can sense. Run, can you run with that? Yeah, very. Um, just it's it's moving away from being kind of organization centric because, you know, like you said, they don't care when the <laughs> the year ends necessarily. Um, I love it. Here's one from um, Amy. Um, so they they do um, have a strong Giving Tuesday campaign, but that's not you know that there's a lot of balance of December left uh, starting on December second. What can people do? If they do have a successful Giving Tuesday campaign, but then they've got you know, almost 20 to 30 days left in the year to do something else, should they keep going strong? Should they maybe look at people who didn't give on Giving Tuesday and maybe segment them out? What do you think there? Yeah, good, good question. And again, I like your word segment. <laughs> so um, after Giving Tuesday, there are two kinds, three kinds of people left in the world. Everybody in the world is going to fall in one of these three categories for Amy's organization. Group number one is people who haven't contributed to our organization ever. Okay. Group number two includes people who gave to us on Giving Tuesday. Group number three mm -hmm. includes those who are past donors but did not give on Giving Tuesday. Yep. Everybody out of 7.5 billion people in the world, everybody falls into one of those three groups. Yep. So let's segment. The people who did give on Giving Tuesday, I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. here's, here's the success of Giving Tuesday. Your gift of $100 combined with others who gave, we, we received uh, $237,000 on Giving Tuesday. Thank you. In order to meet the needs that are out in front of us, would you consider a special gift as we come to the end of the year? Okay. okay so if you're gonna ask them, thank them, acknowledge, give a context, make a request. Yep. 
for those who didn't give. As you may have noticed, we ran a special emphasis right after Thanksgiving. We received $237,000 from people who chose to give on Giving Tuesday. The need has not been met. Mm. Would you consider a special gift as we approach the end of the year? And then for those that we've had no connection with in the past, some, uh, many have given, uh, there's still a need. Would you consider j joining with them? So again, we, we acknowledge what exists, what has happened, what hasn't happened. We make the, the case known for the needs and it's not our need. It's the needs of the constituents that we serve. And we call on people to come to their aid through this avenue that is our organization. I love it. I love segmentation. It just, it, it makes so much sense, right? <laughs> hey, you know what? I, I, there's one thing I want to be sure that we touch on before we wrap mm. up. <clears throat> and um, that's, this is tip number four. You know, I gave, I gave three early ones. But here's what I want to say, and, and to all the development people out there that are locking themselves away and writing this copy, and then going out and, and unloading it on their hapless constituents. Before you do that, I want to ask, ask you, encourage you to get some outside help. And here's why. We, we end up becoming blind to our own writing, our own negligence, or our own overemphasis. Mm -hmm. And so whoever is that person, I'm going to give you some qualifications here. Somebody who is experienced, successful in this very specialized field. I want you to, before you launch it, to take it to that person. Maybe mm. it's me, maybe it's Steven, somebody like that, but ask them for their review and feedback. Yeah. Because you are too familiar with it. Mm. And I say that as one who has been too familiar with my own writing and I become blind to its excesses and its neglect. <laughs> but here's what I want to ask you to do when you do that. Don't ask them to do it for free. And mm. Stephen, if they ask you to do it for free, <laughs> I would encourage you to respectfully decline. And here's why. Number one, the provider that fits that qualification, experienced, successful in this very specialized field. This isn't selling phone service. This isn't selling popcorn at, at Walmart. Mm -hmm. This is very different. Um, that person's input is worth a modest reward. But that's not the most important reason, Stephen, I'm asking you to not do this for free. And that is because free is not impactful. Mm. And I will tell you that I'm weary of people coming to me for free advice and receiving the best advice that I sell and then ignoring it and returning to doing what they were going to do before anyhow. Yeah. So they've wasted my time, they've wasted their time, and they don't get the results. And here's what I know, that we listen differently when we pay than when we don't. Mm. And when we listen differently, we act differently. And we act, when we act differently, we get different results. And your organization deserves better results. And um, free won't get you the best results. Yep. And so get the help that you need. And I mean, I'm not talking, you don't need to, uh, for what we're talking about. You don't need to engage somebody all year long. Um, it may be one review, but your organization, your constituents deserve the best. I uh, give it that. And uh, again, Stephen, I know that, that you help a lot of different organizations. <laughs> your help will be more impactful the more often it is for fee and the less often it is for free. Yep. I love it. Um, a good way to wrap up Kent, since we're about five minutes from the hour, what about January 1st? Uh, I'm probably January 2nd. People are probably working on the first, but what should people be doing thinking about um, as uh, they kind of hit the ground running in, in 2021? So uh, what they need to be doing <clears throat> is exactly what we've just been talking about. It's all the same. Be clear, be concise, be candid, <clears throat> make the needs known. They're not yours. 
the needs belong to somebody else. Make the audience, make the donor the hero. Show them in very clear, specific terms how it is that what they do, what you've asked them to do, will solve a problem for somebody else that that other person can't solve for themselves. And um, what we're talking about is repetition. We're still relevant. The needs are still there. Uh, your gift yesterday fed yesterday's child. Your gift today feeds today's child. Your gift tomorrow feeds tomorrow's child. So make that relevance evident. Don't make them guess. Don't make them strain to figure out why it, why it makes a difference. And invite them, ask them, don't demand. Ask them to be part of the solution and then celebrate the results. I love it. Kent, this was fun. This is a, an hour that flew by and uh, I knew it would, but um, we didn't get to all the questions. And uh, I'm so sorry for that. I wasn't picking favorites, I promise folks. But Kent, if people want to keep talking to you or maybe have a question we didn't get to, how can they get a hold of you? I'll make it easy. First of all, <laughs> let me give you my cell phone number. <laughs> if you're writing stuff down, it's 918-914-2811. And here's my commitment. If I can take your call, I will. And if I can't, I'll return it. How's that? Nice. Um, if it says spam. Unknown caller. Name, <laughs> um, then be sure and leave a good message. And here's my email address. It's Kent, K-E-N-T, at strowmanconsulting.com. Kent at strowmanconsulting.com. And I'd love to um, uh, love to field more questions. Wish we had more time. But you've made this a really fun hour. Thanks, yeah. Stephen. Thanks for what you do. Uh, hope you and your family have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks. Thanks for doing this, Kent. It was a, a fun little chat. Nice way to end the the week. And I'm I'm happy we got to a lot of people's questions. But there's some good ones in here. So you may get some. Uh, I think you're gonna get some humdingers maybe uh, through the phone. So look out for that. Um, and some fiscal year people too. So part of your, uh, your little cohort there. Um, and thanks for all of you for hanging out. Uh, I know you're busy. It's your end. So I appreciate seeing so many people hang out here. We got some cool webinars coming up. Uh, we're going to be talking about plan giving. We're going to talk about corporate sponsorships and partnerships mm. and grants. I want to highlight this one. We're taking next week off for the, uh, the American Thanksgiving holiday at least. Uh, but we'll be back with a bang uh, the week of Giving Tuesday. We're going to talk about leg legacy. And the following week, our buddy Rachel Warner, she came on real early on in the pandemic to do kind of a level set of the grant funding situation. And we invited her back to talk about what's changed over the past eight or nine months. And she's been on the forefront. She does a lot of grant writing and works with a lot of foundations and, um, and grant makers. So Beyond that one, that's going to be a really good one. That is two weeks uh, from Thanksgiving, I believe. If my arithmetic is correct. But check out our webinar page. You've got some cool sessions coming up, uh, even on into 2021, which is hard to believe. Um, so be on the lookout for an email from me with the recording. If you missed anything, you can go back and watch it again, maybe share it with a colleague. But hopefully we'll see you again uh, in December. So if you're celebrating next week here in the States, Hope you have a good Thanksgiving. Stay safe, stay healthy. We need all of you out there doing all this great work. Uh, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Bye now. Thanks, Kent.